Dr. Richard Salvi, what is hyperacusis? Well, hyperacusis is an uh, inability to tolerate loud sounds. Normally, uh, individuals can uh, find sounds up to about 100 dB uh, HL uh, tolerable to, across all the different frequencies. But individuals that have hyperacusis find that sounds that are 70, 65, even 55 dB can be uh, too loud. They uh, sound too loud to them. Sometimes they induce pain and sometimes they induce sort of uh, stress and an emotional response. So uh, that would be the simple definition. There's basic hyperacusis, there's things are just too loud. Other types of hyperacusis where the loud sounds are associated are, are become painful. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't recognize is that have hyperacusis is even normal individuals find some sounds too loud. There's a thing in hearing science called the threshold of pain. So sounds that are up around 130, 135 dB, like a, if you need a jet engine, mm -hmm. those would be not only be loud to a normal individual, those could also be painful. Mm -hmm. So what happens in, with people with hyperacusis is these thresholds uh, for inducing things that are too loud or painful have dropped down into the normal sound ranges that, we, that are normally surrounding us. Mm -hmm. So normal speech is about 65 dB. Mm -hmm. And like no hyperacusis is a bit of a it's not the mechanism is not well pinpointed i want to know your opinion what is the yeah. mechanism behind the hyperacusis it's a psychological disorder or it's more an injury to the auditory nerve or auditory pathway along the auditory pathway well, i think the basic issue about what is the main mechanism like hyperacusis i would say we don't really have a clear idea. We have some hypotheses of what it might be caused by. So one of the hypotheses that sort of developed out of our lab in Buffalo, probably maybe 30 years ago, is that tinnitus and hyperacusis maybe get triggered or started because of damage to the inner ear. So you have a, an inner ear uh, behind your eardrum where the sensory cells are located. And the, the inner ear has sensory cells that act like a microphone. They convert sound into neural activity. And then they're hooked up to neurons that bring the information into the brain. The neurons that go into the brain, you can think of them as a transmission line or a telephone line. So loud sounds will damage either the, the sensory hair cells or the neurons. When, these, when the damage occurs in the periphery, what happens to the neural output from the cochlea is it gets reduced. So your ear is sending less information into the brain. The brain, many people would think 20, 30 years ago, the brain just got less information. But what happens is it, it seems like the, it, the brain that's hooked up to a damaged ear turns up its volume control and it's weak sounds that are coming in from the inner ear, the brain, like just like on your radio, you reach over and you turn the radio up when the weak signal comes in, and then what happens? You start hearing the static in the radio signal, and the signal sounds distorted, and sometimes the signal becomes extremely loud suddenly. So we think, at least our opinion, hyperacusis and tinnitus may arise from this abnormal gain control in the brain. The brain turns up its volume control too much for like a weak sound or moderate intensity sound, and then it sounds way too loud for people with hyperacusis. Mm -hmm. the, the business about the pain part, I think, is less well understood. We if you go and look in the scientific literature about how the auditory system is hooked up to the uh, pain system, it's, it's not well understood. But we have some people working in my lab that are 
trying to understand that there's some studies in the literature from the pain from the pain literature in which people when they're listening to sounds they can actually tolerate uh, more pain more dental pain for example so one of the therapies if you go in for getting a tooth removed is place some sounds to the patient and we don't know what happens when you make the sounds louder it could make this the dental pain even worse rather than uh, more tolerable mm -hmm. but that's less well understood the, the the pain mechanisms there's some groups that think that the there may be pain fibers in the inner ear and there's a group of neurons called type 2 neurons and they don't seem to transmit sound so some people have given them a job of maybe they transmit painful sensations from the ear to the brain mm -hmm. but that's very poorly understood okay oh, so let me just think like research up. now should focus more on understanding because I'm uh, I, I, I read that your that your department at Buffalo University they are doing a study to understand the mechanism of pain and the yes. relation to loud sounds to pain and the yeah. fibers that are activated in the in the ears so what is your opinion about research like at the moment what do you think is the like the best way to go and what is best to understand yeah. first for then we can in the medium term or long term find better solutions and possible even treatments <laughs> There's very, very little research done on hyperacusis. Mm -hmm. uh, about seven or eight years ago, I organized a conference and I made a graph that showed the number of papers, mm -hmm. publications that had tinnitus in the name of the paper or hyperacusis. Mm -hmm. And you could see a steady growth in tinnitus research from about 1975 to the current time. Mm -hmm. but uh, if you looked at the hyperacusis papers, there were less than 10 papers per year. So there's been so little research done on, tenet, on hyperacusis that we know very little about it. So I think my lab, a few other labs, have started to become interested in hyperacusis because their people are kind of interested in the science behind it. So one of the areas of the science is the central gain mechanism that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And the second idea is there may be pain fibers in the inner ear. So people are starting to become interested, but there's very little funding mm -hmm. uh, put into tinnitus research. Brian Pollard, who runs the Hyperacusis Research Group, has been a really a big promoter of research for hyperacusis. And He's actually gotten several laboratories interested in studying this phenomena. Mm -hmm. But researchers are like businessmen. They basically do research on things that they think they can get funded for. Mm -hmm. If there's no money to do the research, then the research scientists can't do the work. They have no money to buy the supplies to do the work or mm -hmm. test the subjects. Yeah, but for example, hyperacusis is something that uh, really affects people's life uh, even more than tinnitus. And do you think there's a reason why there are no more like medical and financial support to more financial well, I think support? One of, to, uh, one of the reasons are, you know, uh, there's a saying in English, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, so, or gets the oil. Mm -hmm. So if hyperacusis patients don't go and talk to their politicians and tell them they should be working on this, mm -hmm. nothing will happen. The American Tinnitus Association about 15 years ago uh, launched an initiative in which they went and spoke to the different senators and congressmen in the United States about spending more money on tinnitus research and they actually got some uh, legislation uh, and uh, uh, put in for getting grant support for doing work on tinnitus. And nobody's really done that so far for hyperacusis. There's no uh, political outreach to get our politicians to put money into this type of research. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would mention about this is that nobody dies from hyperacusis. Mm -hmm. Very, no one that I know of dies from hyperacusis. And 
usually diseases get funding if there's a death or really severe injury. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I would like to mention about hyperacusis, hyperacusis is not something that just affects young people that went to uh, a rock concert or a, a music venue that was too loud. This is a disorder that shows up in autism. People with autism have sensory hypersensitivity disorders. So they're sensitive to too much light, too much sound, too much touch. There's other diseases or disorders called fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. same type of thing. People with migraine, they not only are sensitive to light, they sometimes can be sensitive to sound. So, and this would fall under the general heading of sensory hypersensitivity disorders. They're too sensitive to smell, touch, vision, sound. So I think if you were going to go and promote hyperacusis research, it would be good to tie it to some things like autism. There's a tremendous interest in autism now because in the U.S. I think the statistics are one out of every 68 children mm -hmm. uh, have autism or autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, like we're, we're saying that hyperacusis may have different causes, but what is the most usually cause for hyperacusis? I think, in my opinion, goes back to what we talked about earlier. People often develop hyperacusis when they develop hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So in your case, you're in the MRI scanner. MRI scanners can be extremely noisy. Uh, oftentimes, they don't give you any ear protection. Mm -hmm. uh, people, as they age, they tend to develop hyperacusis because they develop age-related hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So I think hearing loss is one of the triggers. Mm -hmm. You damage your inner ear, mm -hmm. thus information goes into your brain, your brain set, I'm going to compensate for that, okay. turn the volume control up. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, if, I think if somebody did a careful evaluation of most people with hyperacusis, they would find that they have some sort of hearing loss some of which can be detected maybe with a pure tone audiogram, but in other cases, the, you might require more t careful testing. We have uh, animal models in our lab in which there are massive lesions to the inner ear due, to, due to a drug that we give them. Mm -hmm. But even though the, they have this massive lesion, if we do just a simple hearing test on them like a patient would have when they went to a clinic, it would not show up but their ear is really damaged pretty severely. Mm -hmm. So I think you need careful hearing testing to, to diagnose a hearing loss. For example, you're an engineer. Mm -hmm. If you went in and got your hearing tested in Porto, mm -hmm. they probably would test your hearing from about 125 hertz to 8,000 hertz. You actually hear all the way up to 20,000 hertz. No, but they, they don't test the region between 8,000 and 20,000. No, in my case, they did it, they did it to 20,000, and I didn't have uh, any drop below 10 or 20. What happened after is that, like I told you, I started to have the tinnitus and then hyperacusis. And the first months or two, I thought it was okay, this is going to pass, I'm going to live my normal life. And for example, I was in the middle of the beach and kids screaming, yeah. and I started to have, like, it, it, this is strange, I started to have new tinnitus. And when I was going to do again the test, when I put the headsets in the silence, I had much more tinnitus. So it was more difficult to, yes, to yeah. have better hearing while the test. So well, let, me, let me go back to yeah, your let's lack. Let's go back to the interview. And yeah. Let me go back to your lack of hearing loss. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a group at Harvard now that, uh, uh, again, claim there's like a, what's a hidden hearing damage. Mm -hmm. So the hearing damage is not due to your your sensory hair cells, but rather due to the neurons that connect to the hair cells, the synapse that connects there. And they, again, have uh, animal models in which they just give them one small noise exposure. Mm -hmm. And they go back and look at the animals uh, a month or two later, and it looks like they have normal hearing. But if you measure the neural activity that's leaving the inner ear and going to the brain, it's greatly reduced. Okay. 
But on a hearing test, this wouldn't show up, just like on our animal models that we give a drug to. They look like they have completely normal hearing, oh, okay. but they have tremendous damage in their inner ear because in our case, the animals were given a drug. Mm -hmm. In human case, maybe the neurons were damaged okay. uh, for some reason. So, and for the last two questions, like, how does severe hyperacusis affect people's lives? can be really debilitating. I know one financial planner, very uh, well-educated, very successful person. He uh, really can't be around noisy places. He has to wear ear, ear protection all the time. Mm -hmm. Brian Pollard, as you know, he when he goes out into a noisy situation, he always wears some sort of hearing protection. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're, so this can be quite debilitating. You can't go to situations, can't go to concerts, can't go to uh, restaurants where there's a lot of background noise because everything is too loud for you. Mm -hmm. One of the therapies for hyperacusis, we have a clinic at the University of Buffalo that's, I think, pretty good. Mm -hmm. And the audiologists that work in the clinic uh, with tinnitus patients, one of the common treatments for tinnitus patients is some type of sound therapy, low-level sound therapy. Mm -hmm. And another one is with people that have hearing loss, a good treatment, I think a really good treatment is to get a hearing aid because a hearing aid will amplify the background noises. And hearing aids have like a gain control mechanism built into them so that when the sounds get too loud, the hearing aid prevents it from getting too, too, over, too loud. And I know there's some groups around the uh, U.S. that are trying to work on devices that might be effective for helping people with hyperacusis, preventing them from hearing the super loud sounds, but allowing them to hear the moderate intensity sounds. So in your opinion, like a future hope for the patients will be like the development of a mechanical devices, a, a bit like sunglasses for light sensitive, sensitive people? Yes, I guess a, 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 a sunglass that basically gets darker the brighter the light is. You know, we've built things like that. So I think that is really uh, one possible treatment. I think another one is to try to understand what the neural mechanisms are for this because uh, when you listen to a sound, mm -hmm. let's say your teacher when you were in, in grammar school went over and wrote on the board and the sound was very scratchy, yes. mm -hmm. the sound not only had an intensity associated with it, but it evoked an emotional response, right? Mm -hmm. If you hear a baby crying, you know, it gets you very anxious. If a baby is babbling, it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, a, pretty, a nice uh, song will make you feel happy. So sounds not only are having frequency and intensity and duration, they also have, can be tied to emotion. If you're under a lot of stress and the sounds are loud, then the stress and the sounds get coupled together. You know, they get associated with one another. So sounds by themselves can take on, have become emotional meaning to them, mm -hmm. either positive or negative. So many of the sound therapies for tinnitus, the sounds are very soothing. They make you feel comfortable. So now the sound becomes associated with a pleasant event rather than a negative event. Okay. Okay, uh, Dr. Richard Salve, thanks so much for the interview. Okay, you're welcome, Frederico. Good luck. Wait.